R. Allen Stanford was once one of America's wealthiest men, a jet setter with extravagant expending habits who owned banks and mansions worldwide. My number one goal is to fight this thing for the investors and clients who had confidence in Stanford. A Houston jury convicted him on 13 counts of fraud, bringing an end to a years-long saga that began with his arrest for allegedly orchestrating a $7 billion Ponzi scheme. This was not a Ponzi scheme. Never in my life have I ever set out to defraud a person. Never. Hello and welcome to Money Mindfuck. Before we begin, don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel for more intriguing videos like this and be sure to watch this video to the end. Therefore, anytime we upload a new video, you will be notified so that you don't miss out on interesting videos from us. So without further ado, let's dive in. Stanford's father ran a small but profitable insurance agency, and after graduating from Baylor, Allen joined the family business. When the oil bust of the mid-1980s devastated the Houston real estate market, Stanford pounced purchasing distressed properties with money borrowed from his father and friends. Stanford had made his first hundred million by the mid-1990s, as well as many millions for more friends who had invested in his deals. Uh, is it fun being a billionaire? Well, uh, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Stanford began investing in real estate and other ventures in Antigua, a tax haven, and eventually relocated to the island. Stanford's massive investments and civic involvement in Antigua prompted the island nation's leaders to nominate him for an honorary knighthood, which he received in 2006. Following that, official correspondence from Stanford Financial Group and other ventures he owned referred to him as Sir Alan Stanford. Stanford developed an interest in cricket after moving to Antigua, so he bought a professional cricket team then a league, and he altered the rules of this 500-year-old tradition-bound game. A single cricket match can sometimes last for several days. A match was less than four hours long under Stanford's new rules, making it suitable for television. Stanford boasted in Forbes that he hoped to turn cricket into a major television sport and make himself yet another fortune. Life was indeed good for Alan Stanford, Laura Pendergrast Holt, and Jimmy Davis with that kind of money flowing in. Because Alan Stanford had relocated to Antigua to avoid taxes and pursue his newly discovered passion for cricket, many of Stanford's day-to-day -day operations were run from Jimmy Davis's office in Memphis rather than from Stanford Financial Group headquarters in Houston. The moral to this story, is if you're full of BS, it'll get you to the top, but it will never, never, never keep you there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stanford's large number of evangelical Christians prompted the company to invest in Christian theme activities and investments. Stanford invested in a Christian theme film called The Ultimate Gift. The film was ultimately a good investment for Stanford, costing less than $10 million to produce and market but generating more than 30 million in revenue, including DVD sales. The evangelical Christians in Stanford's organization used his investments in Christian activities, as well as Stanford's financial group's support of Memphis-based St. Jude's Children's Hospital to project a high-integrity, family-friendly image. However, fraud complaints and lawsuits began to fly in 2009. A fantastic story began to unfold. Stanford's deception was first revealed in a civil complaint filed on February 17, 2009. This complaint detailed a February 2009 meeting in a Miami airport hangar, attended by three Stanford employees who later became cooperating witnesses. They met with Pendergast Holt, two unidentified Stanford executives, and an attorney. Pendergast Holt informed these employees' informants that the value of assets in one portion of Stanford's portfolio had dropped from $850 million to $350 million in about seven months. Several days later, at another meeting, one of the soon-to-be cooperating witnesses broke down crying because of the revelations and threatened to go to authorities. To add to the drama, 
Alan Stanford went missing on the day the complaint contained this story was made public. There was a nationwide search and a media frenzy that followed. Stanford's offices in Houston and Memphis were raided by federal marshals. Federal agents raided the Dallas office of GodTube, one of Stanford's investments in Christian businesses. Charlotte, which had been the setting for the PTL, Jim, and Tammy Backer scandal a few decades before, also had a minor role in the Stanford saga. Today, two detectives were arrested on charges of shooting up the home of a drug dealer cooperating with federal authorities. Stanford Financial Group had a Charlotte office with over 25 employees, the majority of whom had recently relocated and brought their clients with them from Bank of America, Wachovia, and other Charlotte-based financial institutions. Also in Charlotte, the film foundry, which produced The Ultimate Gift, was cash-strapped. Although its projects with Stanford had been profitable, a large portion of those profits, amounting to millions of dollars, was held in Stanford accounts that had now been frozen by federal authorities. The Open Finance Network, OFN, co-founded by Greg Leakley, the man who helped Stanford recruit Christian financial advisors, shared the Film Foundry building in Charlotte's fashionable South End Historic District. Stanford had invested more than 10 million and pledged millions more in this technology startup. Because of Stanford's involvement, OFN was able to raise more than 25 million in venture capital over five years. The company's technology was almost ready for the market. It had only recently begun to generate revenue. With Stanford's assets now in the hands of a federal judge, cash infusions to OFN came to a halt. Almost all of the 100 employees were laid off overnight. Stories like these were told all over the country. Three days later, authorities discovered Alan Stanford with his girlfriend in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Stanford's lawyers claimed that he was not fleeing, but had simply relocated there with his girlfriend. According to a Justice Department's press release issued shortly after Stanford was discovered in Fredericksburg, the case was built with contributions from the FBI's Houston field office, the Internal Revenue Service Criminal Investigations, and the United States Postal Inspection Service. It was prosecuted by attorneys from the Criminal Division's Fraud Section in Washington, D.C. Having this kind of investigative firepower directed at you is bad news, not only for Stanford, but also for Laura Pendergast Holt and James Davis, two former pillars of Baldwin's First Baptist Church. James Davis initially kept his mouth shut in apparent solidarity with his former Baylor roommate. So Miami became the epicenter, not only of the drug trade, but of the, the, where the drug money was coming into. He invoked his Fifth Amendment rights, refusing to testify or provide an accounting or produce any documents related to the matters outlined in the commission's complaint. However, Pendergast Rapids Holt's rise from the W to a lofty title and a salary of up to $1 million per year was followed by an equally rapid fall. The prospect of trading her pearls and high heels for an orange jumpsuit compelled her to cooperate with authorities. On February 27, 2009, she was arraigned on criminal charges in a Houston court just a week after the first civil lawsuits against Stanford were made public. She was charged with obstructing the investigation into Stanford. Prosecutors had requested that bail be set at $1 million, but Pendergast's attorney Holt successfully argued that because her assets, as well as the assets of thousands of Stanford investors, had been frozen, she could not meet this bond. It was eventually set at $300,000, with her having to produce $30,000. She posted bail and was released, though she was required to wear an ankle monitor, which was not popular among the Mississippi College for Women's polished graduates. Laura Pendergast High Gloss Holtz Veneer was shattered as a result of these events. Her lawyers announced a few weeks later, in March 2009, that she was fully cooperating with authorities. Her old mentor, James Davis, eventually agreed to help. Their cooperation significantly reduced their punishment. Laura Pendergast Holt pleaded guilty to obstructing a Securities and Exchange Commission investigation on June 21, 2012, 10 years ago last month. She was sentenced to three years in prison on September 13, 2012, 
followed by three years of supervised probation. On April 23, 2015, she was granted her complete freedom. Davis was sentenced to five years in prison on January 22, 2013, to be followed by three years of supervised release. He was also the subject of a $1 billion judgment. Jimmy Davis was released from prison on July 24, 2017. Their cooperation aided investigators in building an impenetrable case against Alan Stanford. On June 19, 2009, the Justice Department announced criminal charges against Stanford and four other Stanford Financial Group officials, as well as against Leroy King, administrator of the Financial Services Regulatory Commission in Antigua and Barbuda, where the company had its headquarters. So less than a year after ranking 205 on the Forbes list, FBI agents apprehended Stanford. He was eventually assigned prisoner number 35017-183. But there was still a lot of drama before Stanford was convicted. While in custody, he got into a fight with other inmates who severely beat him. Stanford's lawyers claimed the beating caused amnesia and rendered him unfit to stand trial. After that argument failed, they claimed Stanford was addicted to anti-anxiety drugs, which impaired his judgment and rendered him unfit. That worked for long enough to wean Stanford off the drugs. Stanford's lawyers used the time to sue the FBI and the Securities and Exchange Commission for $7.2 billion, claiming that it was the Gestapo tactics of federal law enforcement, not Stanford's fraud and mismanagement, that caused billions to vanish. While all of these machinations slowed things down, they couldn't stop the inevitable. Finally, on March 6, 2012, after a six-week trial, the jury took only three hours to convict Alan Stanford. Stanford was sentenced to 110 years in prison on June 14, 2012. Prosecutors had sought a harsher sentence, describing Stanford as a ruthless predator who lived a life steeped in deception. Alan Stanford, no longer Sir Alan Stanford after his knighthood was stripped, will die in prison unless something extraordinary happens. However, for many people duped by Stanford, Davis, and Pendergast Holt, prison sentences provide no solace. Ten years later, most of Stanford's victims had received little or no compensation. Angela Shaw's family lost millions of dollars. She told CNBC in 2019, on the 10th anniversary of Stanford's arrest, that the only true justice Stanford's victims could ever see is getting their savings back. Unfortunately, all they have seen and will see is a few pennies on the dollar. That's all for today, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, please like it and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on another wonderful video from us. Till next time.